Hello and welcome to Off The Shelf Reviews. I'm Jess. And I'm Gary. And today we're going to review and discuss Necronomicon, which came out in 1993 from directors Christoph Gans, Shazuki Kaniko, and Brian Yuzna. Gary, why don't you give us a synopsis? Well, the story follows H.P. Lovecraft in a wraparound anthology story where he discovers the Necronomicon and reads three stories to us, the audience. The first story is The Drowned, which follows Bruce Payne, who inherits a house after he's grieving after his wife died in a car accident, which also then leads into the greater Lovecraft mythos. The second story is The Cold, which follows Bess Mayer, who moves into an apartment and then soon discovers that there are strange experiments going on overhead. The third story, Whispers, follows two police officers tracking down a known serial killer known as the Butcher, but what they discover is far more horrific. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting compilation um i have to say this is one of the most like forgotten anthology movies like ever put out there especially when you compare it to say like creep shows the most famous one and this for me it was also a film that never really got distribution in the uk i don't think it ever got televised and the dvd release was also never released in the uk again i have a itch in the back of my mind that i felt like i'd seen it before now where or how or if it's shown up on Channel Four or one of the, when you know, if you're not from the UK, there's there's obviously a few channels in the UK. There's not a great number, but there's always been the, the broadcasting, the BBC, ITV, which is Channel Three essentially, and Channel Four. But um, Channel Four used to do some really cool, kind of grindhouse. Um, That's where I got introduced to yeah, Brain Dead. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm the same. It's uh, they they threw some really interesting stuff on the stuff up on the wall, and some of it stuck. I mean, it was uh, you know, it was. Um, it was awesome, but I feel like I saw it maybe on one of those evenings where I was sneaking downstairs to watch movies when my parents were in bed. This was a film that I had to actively seek out and find somewhere to actually stream the movie. Yeah. Uh, just because I had, you know, a fascination with H.P. Lovecraft and all of the movie adaptations, especially looking at, like, Stuart Gordon and Brian Neusner's work, and then obviously Jeffrey Combs. Yeah. Um, I'd always want to see more, and so this one was one that I had to, had to go and seek out. And we, we, we weren't talking about it because we thought didn't think of anything of it because we saw it and we thought, oh, it's just a throwaway piece of trash. Because, you know, that sounds mean, but you've kind of got to go, why is nobody talking about this? And um, I know I'm sure they're talking about it in the in the fan circles, but um, I don't actively hunt these things down. They kind of have to be brought to me, as it were. So th- again, this isn't something that floated to the surface of like general conversation. Um, it's produced and kind of funding seems to have been fairly strong. Um, and Haddad is famous. He's got a huge filmographer, and I won't go into all of it, but the same year, just to give you an example, this man put out True Romance and Killing Zoe, two of my favourite films of, well, 93. They're all in the same year. All these are all 93 release films. Um, those two are great, and they're yeah. two films that I love. Um, obviously, one written by Tarantino. Um, so this man clearly had his finger on the pulse. Um, this film, I guess, was the third wheel to that, well, those three films. The production of this film was, you know, it was a bit of a labour of love, but it was also full of um, issues on set because they had a warehouse to film this and almost all three slash four mini stories within this film were all being shot simultaneously within the same warehouse. So much so to the detriment of some of the actors, while they would be delivering their lines, they would hear set construction going on not too far away whilst another director was filming their sequence. Um, And so there was also some issues with Shazuke Kaniko, who of course uh, didn't speak a word of English. And so he found it really difficult to communicate what he wanted to his American actors, um, which caused some issues on set too. And there was also the issue of financing and trying to make sure everything came in on budget. Uh, So there was some complications with the producers as to how the production was actually running. But all in all, I still think they did a fantastic job balancing out you know, the actors, the special effects, and the story. Though I will say this film has many, many flaws. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, uh, it, it, there is a... It feels like the parts are not... All parts are not equal. I mean, I think, um, as we'll go into, I think we'll show like more to some parts than others. I think maybe the narrative paid the price for having to allocate budgets in different ways. And I, th- I think that that'll come around... It will be brainless enough to try. Of course. 
is human. Well, I mean, if you're a fan of Jeffrey Combs, you'll kind of recognize him straight away as mm. uh, the special effects or the makeup effects by Screaming Mad George. They did an okay job transforming him to make him look slightly like H.P. Lovecraft, which is one of the things why Coombs almost said he didn't want the part because he felt like he didn't look good enough or didn't look like H.P. Lovecraft. And in the end, I have to say, he kind of looks more like Bruce Campbell than he does H.P. Lovecraft. There's something about that. It all, all, all rhymes. <laughs> it does. Back in it does. <laughs> and, and so he's turned up at this mausoleum slash library because he's, he knows the Necronomicon is there. And he steals the keys from one of the monks or priests that's working there. Yeah. And he runs downstairs, accidentally drops the keys down a grate into what looks like it's filled with water. Don't really know why or how. We yeah. just know there's probably some deep ones down there somewhere. A guardian of the book. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and uh, he starts reading and translating from the Book of the Dead. And that is when we fade into our first story, The Drowned. And we follow Bruce Payne, who plays Edward DeLoper, who has now inherited this house from his uncle. And we're given a flashback to what happened to his relative. It's... A nice segue, and again, it's the book, just to reference, the book kind of talks about being out of time, telling stories out of it, so it feels like all these stories are either around the same time in history, or a li obviously, especially the third one, we'll get to that, it's, yeah. several decades ahead of this point in history. Well, yeah, because the film is fairly well establishes that we're starting in the 1920s era, yes. especially with the shot outside, with the cars and everything mm -hmm. else, but then, yeah, the book itself is timeless, it's seen the future, it's been in the past, it's... It's been everywhere. And it's in all these stories. It is indeed, um, yeah. And uh, it pops up in different places in different ways. Um, and again, it's it's a really cool little kind of story device. And, and that works in a sense if you're talking about how they structure this. But yeah, as, as he kind of arrives at this house, um, shown around by this beautiful kind of... Um, uh, she's not an estate agent, is she? She's kind of a legal... Works for a legal firm. Yeah. So she's, but she she's, was very flirty with him. Despite know, the fact I... that we've just realised that he'd lost his wife in a car accident, and he's not really, you know, acknowledging her advances, it just seems like um, a subplot that really didn't go anywhere. Well, it was only a th again, this this is an hour and a half film cut into three thirty minute segments with a little bit around it to tell the fourth wraparound story. So they've only got thirty minutes to kind of bang these out. It's quite an intricate kind of they, they do quite well the first story is my favorite um and it kind of flows really nicely straight into flashbacks that seem like they've got a really nice budget with the boat you know the um the miniature kind of, boat on fire <clears throat> to the yeah. people scrabbling around and you find out that um the captain had lost his wife and child in the crash yeah the lord's coming home and there's a storm and he regrets taking home his family on this journey with him yeah so they they um and there's there's a kind of like a funeral there's a gathering for them um but he renounces god and religion by Both throwing the, the bible yeah. into the fire and you know, and then he uh, he does, I think he discovers the Necronomicon. Or no, no everyone he's, he's, sends everyone leaves. Everyone leaves, and, and, a, and a fishman yes. uh, turns up, and you a know, deep one sort of a appears. deep one walks in, like you know, covered in seaweed, and uh, tells him that he's not alone. And, and gives the prosthetics him, for that was a, the prosthetics lovely. were really good. Except now seeing this on Blu-ray, you could see that the mouthpiece looked like a like a black cloth behind the teeth, so there was no like inner mouth. And I was just like, oh, like it's a shame that the the modernization of the, of these films, like some of the effects, you can see right through them. Uh, but you know, when you look at the whole thing from afar, it's really intimidating and quite well done. Yeah. But it leaves him the ability to now raise his dead relatives, kind of like what his uncle did before him. Yes, and again, you get the echo of, and then he quotes directly from uh, Call of Cthulhu. Yes. And it's obviously referencing that. That which is not dead can eternal lie. And with strange eons, even death may die. In his lair, Cthulhu waits dream. Although he does at one point call Cthulhu Cat Catlu or Cathlu. I was like, that was a weird pronunciation of the name. I've not heard that one before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the Dreamer in the Deep. And, uh, and essentially, yeah, he reads so in the flashback, shall we say, because you're seeing his great uncle, I think it's his great uncle, essentially, um, raise his wife and child, who have been recovered from the sea, and then they're brought back, but then they kind of 
monstrous monsters, forms with yeah. like actual squids, you know, or octopuses emerging from their mouths. So I was just like, okay, that's that's really cool. Yeah, and it's obviously he's horrified, and while his but he's also so grief stricken that he wants to resurrect and bring back his dead wife, and uh, which he does. And it's also played very well, I would say, by uh, Maria Ford, who's also no stranger to appearing in H.P. Lovecraft mm-hmm. adaptations. Um, and uh, But you could immediately tell, I mean, even in the flashback, obviously we saw the green eyes, the tentacles coming out. We know this isn't going to go very well. No, no, the fact that his great uncle just jumps off a balcony. To commit suicide um, after bringing while, them back. While they're standing sort of shadowily behind a curtain behind him. So and and then the let, he's reading a letter. This is just to clear. This is exposition being delivered through a letter, which is rather nicely done. Eighty years sealed with a wax seal, written by him as he says he's about to jump off a balcony. Um, and it, it's nice foreshadowing. And again, the the letter fades away, and he can't quite read the last few lines, and it leaves the mystique of his wife's protecting the book and and his son, we suppose. Yeah. And his son, I think, is the monster that kind of rises through out of the ground yeah, yeah. The end. well yeah because he he, tra- he ends up wrestling with his now resurrected wife who's also you know emitting tentacles uh before she eventually turns into a giant tentacle which is when we realize there is a giant monster lurking at the bottom of the house <laughs> We kind of got the inclination that the house was deteriorating and falling apart anyway. The moment he arrived, the stairs were giving way. Um, And there is also... I mean, the miniature effect of the monster is brilliant. Mm. I really love it. But the miniature of the house kind of collapsing around it... You know, you can immediately tell that it is a miniature, but it's still very effective. Yeah, I felt... But like I said, the budget for this, for its time, is pretty solid. I mean, this yeah, whole, it's pretty the whole CGI. setup of this... There's some nice morphing effects when hmm. when uh, when she turns back into the tentacle, and you kind of see her human form at the end of the tentacle, and I was like, that's, that's really quite imaginative and really well done. Yeah, yeah, and it's like it's all um, off his son, who's become the monster, the, well, the, the son of the older... Um, relative, yeah. relative, yeah. Um, so it's kind of a cursed family legacy. It, it's got a few echoes of like the locals have rooms at the house. It, it's, or it's it's very, very. Um, it's good mythos. It's good well, mythos. Well, it, it, it was originally. I mean, all the stories in this are very loosely adapted from the stories, but this one's like the um, the rats in the walls. Mm-hmm. But like, but then it goes into like you know the. Um, like the Cthulhu Dagon mythos at the same time. So yes. it really is just a blending and emerging of all the different ideas um, from the Lovecraft stories. Yeah. But it does end like with a like, bit of an action sequence where he's dangling from a chandelier, which he cuts loose and drops it right into the eye of the beast. As he smashes <laughs> his way out of a stained glass window into yeah. the sunlight, and it, the sunlight <laughs> burns the creature. <laughs> So you end up kind of in kind of a okay, a happyish ending, I guess. Yeah, well, the best <laughs> the best outcome you can kind of hope from these sorts of things, and it is it is the uh, of the three the only one that sort of ends on a slightly neutral note. Yes, uh, he's yeah. kind of not been able to truly bring back the one he loved, but he's at least come to some personal reconciliation. Indeed, <laughs> you yeah. Know, he's realised maybe I just accept that the universe has an order to it, and I shouldn't dick around in it. Especially with books called the Necronomicon. <laughs> we then loosely cut back to the monks at this m- mausoleum, at this library, and uh, they are—they let us know that they're aware that Lovecraft has gone in there and retrieved the Necronomicon, and they're just kind of like, "Well, he's a human." That's to be expected, and we're like, oh, yeah. so these are actually aliens. Yeah, and it's foolishness, the foolishness and the hubris of it. He, he doesn't know what powers he messes with, <laughs> and that's kind of the classic kind of. Before we then fade into the second story of the cold, and it starts with um, Eddie Spaghetti turning up at this woman's doorstep, asking her or inquiring about some disappearances and strange murders that have been occurring here. As he's a reporter for over several years, it's like innumerable deaths and missing yes. persons. Um, uh, but he, he tracks her down and she starts telling him about the story about her mother who got involved moving into this apartment with the strange doctor that lived on the top floor. Mm. 
And of course, she was running away from her stepfather, her sexually abusive stepfather. And then she's kind of rescued by Dr. Madden, who stabs him in the palm with a, with a scalpel, causing him to fall down the stairs. And, well, we don't actually know if he died at the bottom of the stairs or if he was dragged away and then murdered by Dr. Madden because she wanders up the stairs in the middle of the night. I think it's insinuated he's murdered. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think... Because uh, yeah. she wanders up the stairs in the middle of the night to see him with a massive drill bit. Now, I was looking at the drill, and I don't think the drill's actually moving, but we've got the, the sound effects of, of churning bone in metal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. Again, it's pretty good in all these cutaways, and, you know, it, it, it's leaving you not really sure what's going on. Um, and again, the Doctor, as we said, seems... Madden's doctor seems to be a good guy, but... Seems to be. He claims that he's suffering from um, a skin condition, so he has to keep his room incredibly cold, and he has to stay out of daylight. So you're like, like, vampire kind of thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, sort of. I think he, he needs certain fluids to stay alive. Um, and as as the story progresses through that, you kind of get a little bit of a side story. They do take the girl, and she tries to get a job at a local cafe, and to try to, you know... Get her life back on track. Yeah, yeah. and she, she gets to know a local diner owner, and uh, but then that comes back, obviously, in cy- cycles of uh, more uh, murder and mayhem. Um, but she then encounters the good doctor later, and they kind of fall in love in their own... It's, a, it's again, this is only 30 minutes kind of short, so they kind of... It isn't badly done for the time they're playing with. Um, yeah. I think it, it, it was... And all... well, for me, it did feel incredibly rushed. Like, I didn't feel like any kind of romance blooming between the characters and the next thing i know they're having the one of the most awkward sex scenes in film history <laughs> as the um as the housekeeper is watching from afar because she she loved again it's revealed as you find out she's a sycophant to the doctor and she's always loved him but he doesn't love her but the doctor clearly falls in love with this young girl um and they make out in a rose kind of greenhouse he has on the top of the uh Big, yeah. This big house. He he explains to her how he's been keeping himself alive by injecting that 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 serum. I mean, I don't think that's entirely and, and you see the, the Necronomicon. The spine, he's been drawing this knowledge from the Necronomicon. Yeah. Um. So so he resurrects this this dead rose, and that was kind of it was okay, kind of um time, reverse time lapse photography of the rose. Yes. As it turns out. The trick is not preserving life. The trick is maintaining the quality to which one is accustomed. Uh, which, which was okay, and you know, then becomes a symbol that she has, like towards the end of the story. Um, but yeah, she kind of she falls in love with the doctor, and it just for me, it felt incredibly forced. I didn't believe in their relationship or, or these characters that much at all, um, and so th- th- this story really. You know, it really started to lose me in the anthology. But mm. the, with, with the fact that I knew it was an anthology, I was like, the first one was so good. The wraparound story's got Jeffrey Coombs in it, so it's a win. Like, I can only hope that, that things get yeah. better. In the middle one, I mean, it, it, it resolves, obviously, as they go through with her turning out to leave him, then come back because she's pregnant. And not just pregnant, it turns out she's STZ gain the same weakness he has so yeah so she needs the cold environment doesn't like the sunlight and but, she needs spinal fluid and she needs spinal fluid but she also <laughs> finds out that 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 dr madden is now extracting spinal fluid from her boss from the restaurant yes which causes her to kind of get, get upset and interfere which causes dr madden to sort of lose his temper at the same time no no, no it's, it's the house um the housekeeper's like no no she must die she knows too much yeah um but he gets angry at this and he ends up knocking chemicals he doesn't over. want her hurt yeah yeah and and ends up starting a fire which of course causes him to start melting and losing most of his face um, he then kind of declares that he can't feel no pain as he eventually just rips all of his skin off of his face and just becomes like a rips dissolving over, yeah. skeleton. He tears himself apart, essentially, <laughs> at the end, which is pretty awesome and gruesome. It's an amazing effect. Like, it's so well done. Like, they said when they were making it, like, you know, like everyone on set when they filmed it were just like, that's awful. Like, the, the effect is terrible. No one is going to think this is scary or horrible. So they were like, okay, do it again. We'll just cover it in goo and have some smoke machines letting off some smoke. And all of a sudden, this effect just works. Yeah. And it's like just a few simple layers added onto it really sells it. Yeah, and so the, you kind of get that final sequence of death. Oh, the housekeeper shoots the girl. Yeah, in, in jealousy, in anger. 
Yeah, in um, desperation to save the man she loves. But that's loves. when she declares to, to her that she's carrying his child and the fact that she loved Dr. Madden, therefore she should love his, his child. <laughs> so she saves her clearly with the macabre sciences involved. And it's then revealed... We cut be- back to the yeah. modern day. Sort of, I'm not his actual daughter. Um, I'm still And that's her. not my mother. Yeah. I'm the immortal girl from the past. And she now you see this aged, ancient, crone version of the uh, housekeeper from the uh, earlier part of the story. And so that's the horror ending as the uh, reporter is dragged off to his <laughs> inevitable spinal fluid draining doom. Um, yeah. Because, you know, to maintain immortality. Because she can only feel the baby move when they're magically, you know reanimated one yeah. day maybe i'll give birth to this baby yeah it's a pretty oh, haunting man. final image for her that she's she'll never give birth to this child that she can feel moving every so often yeah it's pretty it's nice and macabre i like i like the second episode it's it is in reverse order i'd probably say my favorites go in reverse on this okay yeah because i think that's how i feel the first one's brilliant the second one's not quite as sharp the budget doesn't feel quite there there again this story feels like it needed more space to breathe yes it really did it really uh, did I, again but it's an anthology of horror so it's throwing ideas at you and it, it does feel like you know they're, they're, they're setting up these stories and characters just to get to the special effects it's like they've got these ideas for special effects and they just needed a story to get to to that point. To be cruel, that could be said for a lot of horror films. This is true. Yeah, um, this is but true. in a sense, this it, it is a smaller scale because instead of multiple sequences, one or two horror notable horror sequences in most of these little anthology thirty minute stories. And I think you know there's a couple of memorable sequences in each of them. Yes. But uh, yeah, I think it pays a price for the structure. But again, it's a Cthulhu story, and um, the audience for that in an era scheme with the scream queens which was more the well this was 93 so yeah. it's coming to the end of that one well, no, it's always been the certain it's not mainstream horror because if you're getting it's not you know the more cerebral you go with horror the less of an audience you're going to get but having a man chase a chick around in the woods in with her a underwear, chainsaw <laughs> yeah you, he's got a dagger or a chainsaw yeah. and she's in her underwear it, it, it's easier to sell that to the mass market than it is something about an evil book and yeah. Loss and love and tragedy and um, the desire to live forever and and you know in, in su- more subtle narrative storytelling in the in the way that I think you find with a lot of this sort of horror. Definitely. So then we very briefly cut back again to Jeffrey Coombs, who's still reading from the Necronomicon, and the uh, the priests are getting anxious that he hasn't finished the ritual or opened the doorway yet, because mm. every time he finishes transcribing one of these stories, another doorway opens up behind the safe. Yeah, the safe where he got the book from starts to kind of unlock like a key. Indeed, indeed. Which then leads us into the third and sort of final story, which is the more action-packed one. It starts with a high-speed chase as two police officers, Signe Coleman playing Sarah, and Oba Babatundi, who plays Paul, her partner. And again, it's kind of like the um, the uh, the pregnancy thing comes up as an issue then, where he's like, I'm sorry we had sex, I'm sorry I got you pregnant, please slow down this car, are you but trying to kill me? He's an idiot, me? he undoes his belt. He undoes go, his seatbelt! slow down because look, I'm in danger now, and then obviously they have a car accident. This is obviously <laughs> based on, um, this is called Whispers, by the way, yeah. and it's based upon the um, Whispers in the Darkness. The last one's more or less based on Cool Air. Again, yeah. loosely, all of these are super Very loosely loose. based on these, these short stories by Lovecraft. Um, and again, there's this kind of, the car flips, and then there's an accident, and you know, they, uh, she wakes up and he's been dragged off by the man the who was chasing him. The, yeah. she was the, the, the butcher who's been killing people locally. You know, clearly a serial killer there. They, they know the whereabouts of, sort yeah. of. But apparently the cops are too afraid to do anything about it. Maybe. Yeah. You're not really sure what's going on in the city. It's very... It's the... all a bit vague. And this <laughs> this is the weakest of the three stories. Because... I, I laughed out loud. I mean, I always do when you see sped up car chase footage. If it's There's not a couple well of shots. edited. If yeah. it's not well edited and doesn't trick you... Keep your eye tricked away from the the ground. Move. Yeah, if you can see things on the ground and around the street at the rate of the cars moving, it's just like, yeah, that's not a high speed chase. No, <laughs> and again, it's the same with like Indiana Jones and stuff. Where oh you yeah, get those, yeah. Where a lot of the kind of bits where they're under the vehicles and they're just going around. really slowly. Yeah, they're going yeah. really slowly. But then they get the long drawn out shots where they stumbling on top of the vehicles and maybe they are really yeah, going at the speed, correct, yeah. the speed that the action sequence is aimed to be at. It, it keeps you trick. It tricks the mind. It tricks the eye and keeps you thinking. Yeah. But with this, they failed to do that here. Yeah, the whole well, this this whole this 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 particular part feels like it's just um, a lot tighter than it needed to be. 
in terms of it felt that like 30 minutes really crushed this story yeah um there's some cool sets again i feel like the set building team on this yeah built amazing sets but it just felt like everything was a tiny bit smaller in scope than it needed to be yeah didn't have enough time to explain what's actually going on in this part of america well, she bumps into uh to don kalfa yeah you'll recognize as ernie from return of the living dead and she immediately accuses him of being the butcher because he has these strange kind of overslip shoes that she recognized the butcher dragging her partner away from from the wreckage of the car uh but then they also we also get introduced to his wife so you got mr and mrs benedict and they're like no no we're not the butcher we wouldn't have anything to do with it i always wanted to have kids you got a million reasons against it i'm too young i wasn't too, too young and i'm not too you, old you weren't able well to i'm able now. i'm ready just shut up yeah, and it all seems dumb at this point. If she's she's that nervous, she she, she has a gun. She's on a them. super aggressive cop who's yeah pointing the gun at them, accusing them of being the killer, then demanding that they take her to her partner it's and the killer like, who's apparently and the killer, down, yeah. oh yeah I'm the landlord and he's he he should, he probably, should probably pay me rent and he lives downstairs and I like this character I like um this kind of bumbling oath but I, again it's a trick because he is yeah. the villain of the piece or part one of the two villains of the piece um and i just but the story feels like the she, she's not handcuffed them up and just gone and alone. No. she just trusts them she's just gung-ho so she's just straight down into the basement where she ends up surrounded well she it looks it's like really she's quick, ended up in yeah, hell yeah because it's you know <laughs> a sea of corpses you have this blind woman who's like sniffs her and goes oh you're pregnant it's like oh that's creepy um and again it is that's the wife um, yeah and again you've got all these quick the story's so quickly wrapped up we kind of we're ad living here but there really isn't much meat to this no. as a narrative it's not like the emotional connection they don't build up the partner's emotional connection because they're so abruptly put in he's just like oh that's my wife and she's like no that he's not my husband and it's like well are they are well, their they? relation i was talking about the cops that's the <laughs> yeah, problem yeah. both of them are so ambiguous in their relationships like because they only have a two minute conversation in the car before she crashes it right and he intentionally hospitalizes himself and then obviously you know the horror ensues when they finally get down to the crypts below where she's been led by ernie yeah yeah um and they get down there and um well it's it's a charnel house it's just full of yeah. corpses they've been slaughtering and <laughs> they're gonna eat her bone marrow well she eventually finds her partner who's been calling out to her mm. um but then you you know there's more a, of a zombie at that it's point. more of a zombie yeah now there's a couple of shots where i'm like it looks like the, the entire back of his head is missing and then in the other shots it looks like just a bit of goo on his head uh, but she ends up wrestling with him for a little while before we discover that his brain and his and his consciousness has been taken from his body and put into one of these monsters. They took my mind. They need us to breed. And we find out that this like cave complex, this basement, whatever it is, there's there's hundreds of the of these creatures down there and they all have inside them the brain and the floating eyes <laughs> of its host and a small little mouthpiece where her partner can continue to talk to her and you know as a, like a, for body horror for existential horror it's incredibly frightening <laughs> But the, but somehow it doesn't then, work that well. No, because then we get like that wacky couple coming back and just, you know, it's just so bizarre when they're just looking down there, you know, and eventually she ends up getting knocked out and she wakes up in a hospital and you're like, oh, it was all a fever dream. Well, they were cutting her arm off at that point and then she wakes up and it seems to be a dream and it's her mum and the doctor. Yeah. And then, <laughs> then it really, you realise that's actually a hallucination and it zooms, zones back into the, into the, the kind of hell pit of all the corpses she was yeah, laying in. And she's missing her arm and then we find out she's missing her legs and then all of the creatures start to feed on her. Just and like... she's laughing hysterically, and <laughs> it, it all seems it's it's surreal. 
too surreal, I think that's the problem. It did literally feel like it ground, jumped off the yeah. deep end. There was no, like, escalation. It just kind of just went from zero to ten incredibly quickly. Hammy, at the term hammy horror, I think, is where you kind of end up with that. And the fact that I didn't really, you know, care for the characters in this story either. It was just more of a exercise in awesome, awesome as effects. As much as we grumble at the shortness of the story in the second one, it's totally overshadowed in this one because at least you had some character development in the part two. In yeah. this one it just felt like you didn't give time for the anything, main, yeah. The, the main the two cops to have any emotional connection. So you would care more about them. The fact yeah. that he undoes his belt in the car, you're just like it hurts your brain. It it's does. Just like you're in a high speed police chase. That may be a mass murder in the car ahead, but you're now having a a relationship feud and you thought I'm doing your belt none of this makes any sense and I don't, again I'm not critical of any of the actors I felt like they're all pretty strong for their roles and again this is the other thing about this whole anthology they're all well produced there's a bit wobbly bits here and there but um, it just um, making anthologies 30 minute short stories into one mega film it's a very ostentatious kind of attempt and I, don't, I can't think of many other films that have tried it in, in a kind of feature length of this budget um at any point, it's just um, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, well, for me, the the entire film is held together by the outlandish, imaginative, and overwhelmingly good practical effects. Well, we get in the wraparound because the wraparound is good because she because obviously when that ends with her laughing as she's devoured, um, I guess I'm put in a jar like all the other human brains. You then cut back to a good love, old Lovecrafty uh, who's, who's now opened the portal. But uh, the, the, the the monks are demanding that he open the door. But he's like, well, I dropped the key. So you then get another really cool effect as he kind of stretches his skull and his torso. All the monsters. And then and Lovecraft whips out a sword cane. From his cane, yeah. right? Because he's then, wrestling with the yeah. deep one monster. He kills the monster beneath him that had the keys. <laughs> and then he's wrestling with the evil monk. Because only, what the particular lead monk you've encountered, no other monks are around. Yeah. Um, he pushes himself through like bars that are super thin. Cause yeah. It's a, it's a he's clearly clearly an alien inside a human <laughs> skin suit. Yeah. Uh, f- um, but he and, ends up tearing his entire like face off. Yes. <laughs> he's like peeling it all the way back to reveal this monster more underneath the monster. Yeah. Um, At the same time, there's like a flying polyp kind of monster flying through a kaleidoscope of colorful effects. The, the portal to yeah the, the else world in the safe that's now open. <laughs> And um, obviously they wrestle, and Lovecraft throws him in the way, and it dev- bites the- and sucks away the hot, devours yeah. and sucks up the whole evil monk alien monster, and drags him back into, into the, the safe, portal, the yeah. safe slams shut, and then the Lovecraft door just runs back into his, yeah. into the, the well, the cab. door magically just opens because it was locked. Yeah, that's and true. And then he yeah. grabs the Necronomicon and runs off into the night. Uh, I have to say, it was also Brian Usner was the uh, cameo as the uh, the cab driver. <laughs> yes, and the, one of the monks screaming after him, "You'll be paid for your insolence, <laughs> Lovecraft." Lovecraft. <laughs> um, and it, it's again, but it's tongue. It's not too hammy. It's, yeah, it's done with enough subtlety that there, there are all these men sitting it, around it, in the library looking a bit <laughs> perturbed as Lovecraft. It break. did feel like incredibly rushed, but it still it still worked for That's me. That's the price of an anthology, though. You're telling half it, it, uh, the, the kind of wraparound stories, and just uh, this is how Lovecraft got all these stories. Yep, ah. this is how he knew to write because I, I like. Right at the beginning, he was just like, oh, nobody believes my writings. My work is actually fiction. I would never lie to the public. I'm trying to Edu- enlighten yes, them yeah. as to, the, to those, you know, arcane arts that have been kept secret by those with that have retained power. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's an interesting angle to take with it. It, it, it is fun. It is yeah. genuinely a fun little story. And again, I like the wraparound, how it works. And he drives off into the night and it ends. There's no, he seems to escape with the book and not yeah. un, unpursued and by anything mortal or uh, physical in the world. Um, yeah. And again, it ends in a kind of nice, fun... There is a fun bounciness to this story, and I think... I, I, I feel that's the best... I'm just trying to p- summarise my feelings. Overall, it's fine. It's a good, entertaining romp. Um, well, what were your favourite or most memorable sequences from the film? I liked... In the first... Just to go for the first one, you know, episode by episode, I liked... The way the the whole ship wreck in the first—I mean, it, I know it's not horror based, and I feel the first part somehow is more emotionally driven. So horror, a good horror, sometimes is the least flashy. 
because it's psychological. And I like the loss of the the way they dealt with the loss of his family and the shipwreck where he wakes up screaming for his family. I thought the whole shipwreck sequence rolling into him waking up and realizing his wife and child are dead. It's, it sets up the classic make a deal with the devil scenario, which is just I just thought that's probably why the first one works so well, because it plays on a clean trope. I mean, you can argue these have been run over and over again, but a desperate man makes a deal with the devil because he's lost what he loves the most is a clean and simple motive that we can all understand. What would you pay to bring back the ones you love the most? So I, I felt that in the first sequence. I mean, there's other cool, like the monster bursting on the floor at the end, but I preferred the opening and the shipwreck and the model. That all looked the brilliant. Yeah. It was just the, the whole scene. It all looked great. And the second one... Um, I think when he turns off to pieces, it looks amazing. It does, uh, yeah. And but around that, that is kind of the only standout. Like the rest of it is subtle. There is some interaction, but none of it, as you say, the weird sex scene doesn't really work. So in that second one, it's it's all kind of woven nicely, but I I can pick at it too much. And the third one is a hard one because I think it's cool where the 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 wife is creepy. And I think her interactions where she smells she's pregnant. And at that point, you don't just shoot her in the face. I'm like, none of this makes any sense. Uh, <laughs> just like, yeah. there, there's some creepy interactions. But the, the effects, I don't feel as strong in the third one either. That's feel where I, I don't know. I thought the effects were still pretty good. Especially, you know, the, the crypt of corpses. Yeah, and... the charnel house where you have almost yeah. all, the, the dead piled up. Yeah, that's good. And yeah. I, I, like, I like seeing the brain with the eyes on, on the stems oh, floating around in this liquid. It's all right. <laughs> <laughs> Not my thing. I, no. I, I didn't, it didn't quite appear to me as much as some of the other more subtle horror <laughs> i enjoyed that very much <laughs> what's your preferred bit though? um my preferred bit what would when my favorite story of the three would be you know the uh the story in the house um i thought the drowned segment was probably the best part it had great atmosphere great effects and performances um i think the best effect for me was the you know the underground uh, monster emerging up with its one blinking eye and its massive giant gaping maw um, with uh, Maria Ford as a tentacle arm. Um, I yeah, thought that yeah. was really cool. It was good for its time as well. 93's CGI, that, yeah. that was, again, it's it's surprising. Again, they, were, they didn't overuse CGI because it wasn't that strong at that point. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'd also say one of my favourite effects was... Um, was David Warner melting, pulling off all of his skin and yeah. flailing around? No doubt, that was the that was high really point well of the done. second part. Yeah, yeah, that took me by surprise how good that actually looked. Um, I would also say uh, the reveal of um, Paul's brain. Uh, what can I say? It was very cool. It was very creative. Yeah, really enjoyed uh, I that. I mean, part. the monster, the monsters were just weird. I mean, that's the that's the criticism you can pick up the whole thing. Some of the stories motives and the monsters were just strange. Yeah, I mean, and that's fine with mythos, but you kind of either it was too explicit what their motives were i need bone marrow i need yeah. spinal fluid and and that's where you're like well what what that's just a bit perf- yeah. i think when you're dealing with matters of the soul and spirituality it's more scary because you're not it's thereafter your very essence what yes. defines you as a sentient creature and like the first one the deals made lives lost it was more emotionally tied the second two were just like oh it's it... splatter for the sake of fun yeah yeah well, the mo- the mo- yeah I, I felt that that's where the yeah that was the issue and i think it was a diminishing returns as you go yeah. through this they they opened strong and then finished a little weakly yeah and i have to say the there was some was uh, i like the wraparound there the was i i think the weakest element of the film for me was probably in the, in the script in the scripting stages like the actors mm. did a good enough job with a flimsy script and there were some some lines some cheesy lines that just made me laugh out loud because i was just like yes. oh, where did that come from um like the sequence where you know the uh, the estate agent lady is is just like oh you know it's too bad that uh, the crabs can't talk You're like what <laughs> yeah and you had the little crab go across the case that he yes. put down and there was subtlety to that i felt the first episode had more it was weird but she was flirty with him yes. almost inexplicably and it wasn't it wasn't you thought oh is she a villain no Oh, okay. And I didn't mind that. In a sense, she felt like a red herring in that play. Yeah. She was a misdirection to lead you astray from yeah. what was really the going on. Yeah. Which, again, the monsters and the walls, the kind of the mother and son that still haunted this place almost. Yeah. And uh, then he repeats the mistakes of his ancestors. But Well, small bit of trivia for you. Mm-hmm. Did you recognise any of the music in the film? No, I didn't actually look at that. The music for the second uh, the second chapter was composed by Daniel Licht, who would go on to be the series music composer for Dexter. And there's a moment when the reporter is at her house, and the 
the violin synth sound effect um, would would be the music that would be used in every single episode of Dexter, and it was originally created here. It rings a bell. Yeah, no, that reminds me. Yeah, no, you're right. I did pick up on that. I didn't know. You know, it's funny how you don't pick up on things like that. Yeah. The Dexter was a good fun, little bit of a romp. Well, Jess, do you recommend Necronomicon? Yes. I would say it's good for anyone who enjoys, obviously, as we're theme thematically generally real of late, um, the kind of mythos-themed horror. Um, it's also just a fun little horror romp. I mean, like I said, we're, we, we, we're digging at the third and second act. A little, um, I could say act parts. Um, but it's still fun. I mean, it's the, the, the prosthetics... The date, little bit dated CGI here and there, but it's still pretty good. The rotoscoping and the safe, again, looks a tiny bit dated. But again, that's the fun of watching old films. I mean, it's it's not like I'm going to go, what you know, it's why people argue you shouldn't remaster films and change them, I think. Um, like, they're doing apparently with Lord of the Rings trilogy recently got touched up, um, and that was a bad move, most people seem to think. But... Again, it's. It, it, I think this is a good film, and I would recommend it soundly to m most people. I mean, as long as you like horror, you're going to have fun with this. And if you like Mythos, it's a bonus. Oh, hell yeah. I'm definitely going to be recommending Necronomicon, even though it has many flaws and is only very loosely based on H.P. Lovecraft's mm. works. Watch this, primarily for some fantastical practical effects from legends in the industry, including... Screaming Mad George, Tom Savini, and John Carl Buchler. The gore, the monsters, the animatronics, miniatures, and makeup were all truly fantastic. The four short stories, including the wraparound, vary in quality and pace, but all provide a good level of entertainment, especially for genre fans. Bruce Payne was the standout best actor, really delivering that tormented and grief-stricken soul, elevating his story above all the rest. It's always a pleasure to watch Jeffrey Combs hamming it up, and David Warner is always just good to watch. The direction was fairly solid and interesting to see such a collaboration of filmmakers delivering tales from H.P. Lovecraft's mythos. The script at times felt like it needed work, but I still enjoyed the cheesy dialogue and alien characters. I really had a fun time watching this, and it is a mostly forgotten and overlooked anthology movie that deserves to find its audience. Give this film a watch. It's imaginative, quirky, messy, and dripping with goo. Good times. <laughs> Thanks for watching Off The Shelf Reviews. Bye-bye.